First gospel reading is from Mark, chapter 6, verses 45 to 54. Pew Bibles is page 929. Immediately, Jesus gave his disciples, made his disciples get into the boat and go on ahead of him to Bethsaida, while he dismissed the crowd. After leaving them, he went up on the mountain to pray. Later that night, the boat was in the middle of the lake, and he was alone on the land. He saw the disciples straining at the oars because the wind was against them. Shortly before dawn, he went out to them, walking on the lake. He was about to pass them by, but when they saw him walking on the lake, they thought he was a ghost. They cried out because they all saw him and were terrified. Immediately he spoke to them and said, Take courage, it is I. Don't be afraid. Then he climbed into the boat with them, and the wind died down. They were completely amazed, for they had not understood about the loaves. Their hearts were hardened. When they had crossed over, they landed at Gennesaret and anchored there. As soon as they got out of the boat, people recognized Jesus. Well, we continue. Uh, let's check the mic here. Check, check. Can you hear me? One, two, three, four, five. There we go. We continue our series from the book of Mark today, um, looking specifically at the third section of six, in which Mark's gospel breaks it down, starting with Jesus, the great teacher, then going to Jesus, the prophet, and this week, we're looking at Jesus as Messiah. So each of these corresponding ideas uh, correspond to a section of the book of Mark, which I hope you're following. If you'll turn in your Bibles to the book of Mark, we're going to be picking up in chapter 6. For those of you less familiar with your Bible, it's probably two-thirds of the way into the Bible. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, in that order. So Mark chapter 6. We left off with a dramatic sort of piece. John the Baptist beheaded. And Jesus is now without, without his cousin, the one who has gone before him has laid down his life, as eventually Jesus will. And Jesus' his ministry is taking over the ministry that John has had, the voice of one calling in the wilderness, not prepare the way of the Lord, but repent, for the kingdom of God is here. So in Mark 6, you'll notice that around verse 30, there's a story of the feeding of the 5,000. The story of the feeding of the 5,000 is the context for our reading today. Our reading today. Now, you will notice as we go through Mark today, there are two accounts of feedings, one of 5,000, one of four, both in Mark. You'll notice, too, that there are two stories in which Jesus calms the water. The first one was in Mark chapter 4 in which a storm comes up on the sea. Jesus is asleep in the back of the boat, and the disciples wake him and say, don't you care if we drown? And Jesus says, peace be still, calms the water, and the disciples cannot fathom the fact that here is somebody who even the wind and the waves obey. This is the transition in Mark's gospel from Jesus as teacher to Jesus as prophet. Jesus has moved beyond rabbi. He's now doing extraordinary things that no rabbi uh, would, would normally be able to do. I was talking to Jeff Park last week after church, and Jeff gave me the word that this is. When a rabbi has extraordinary power and moves into the prophetic realm, the power is called shmika. All right, that's interesting. Jesus not only has Shemekah, he has something extra. He's an extraordinary rabbi. He's a prophet, but he's clearly more, and we're getting to that in today's lesson. So as Jesus is uh, gathered there, it's uh, well, let's just read it. 
The apostles gathered around Jesus and reported all that they had done and taught. Remember, that's where we left off. He had commissioned them, and they had gone out and done what he had done, and they were so excited, and they came back and told Jesus about everything that had happened. And then it said, because so many people were coming and going that they did not, did not even have a chance to eat, he said to them, come with me by yourselves to a quiet place and get some rest. Now, I just want to pause there for a quick second because that is Jesus' invitation to you as well. How many of you had a really busy week? I envy the rest of you. When you've had a busy week, you know what that entails. Let's just think about the routines. Maybe you sleep well, maybe you don't. If you're like me and you're not sleeping well, you're awake from between, say, 1, 1.30, 2.00, somewhere around there, till about 4.30, roughly 20 minutes, 30 minutes before the alarm is going to go off. Okay? So when you're supposed to be getting up, you're in the dead, tiredest, most restful place you've been all night, and you just want to sleep. You just want to be in bed. The alarm goes off. What are the morning routines? Everybody's varies a little bit, but altogether it looks something like preparing yourself for the day, eating, exercising perhaps, um, maybe you have to commute very early so you're getting in the car. You might pray. You might do a devotional. Some people are very structured in their spirituality, morning, noon, night. Some people are not. Some people are morning people. Some are night people. I don't know what you are. Maybe your work starts later, but then you're, you're in the wheel and you're running. Things are getting done in your day, you know, whatever that looks like. We're busy. And we're asked to follow Jesus, not just do our jobs, not just tend to our families, not just live our lives in the rat race that we call life. We're asked to follow Jesus. And the invitation that he gives to your life today is come apart for a time and let me give you some rest. Be with me. Rest with me. Listen to the invitation again. Come with me by yourselves to a quiet place and get some rest. But you say to me, I don't have a quiet place. I have three kids at home. They're constantly making noise. You know, life is busy. There's always a dog barking next door. Jesus isn't talking about a literal quiet place. We have few of those in the world anymore. Even if you're out in the middle of the Sierras backpacking, you get the jets going over. You get the sound of the wind in the trees. Nothing's absolutely quiet. So what Jesus is saying is, let's go to a quiet place. That is to say, let's go to a place together where your soul can be stilled, where you can listen, where something interior can happen in your life for a change instead of this running and racing that you're doing. The disciples have just come from a time of productivity, and Jesus invites them to rest. So they went away by themselves in a boat to a solitary place, verse 33. But many who saw them leaving recognized them and ran on foot from all the towns and got there ahead of them. They, they saw where the boat was going, and they knew, and they, they went there. When Jesus landed and saw the large crowd, he had compassion on them because they were like sheep without a shepherd. That's an important verse. We'll come back to it. So he began teaching them many things. By this time it was late in the day, so his disciples came to him and said, This is a remote place, and it's already very late. Send the people away so that they can go to the surrounding countryside and villages and buy themselves something to eat. But he answered, You give them something to eat. They said to him, it would take almost a year's wages, and are we to go and spend that much on bread and give it to them to eat? No imagination for what's coming next. How many loaves do you have? He said, go and see. When they found out, they said five and two fish, and Jesus directed them to have all the people sit down in groups on the green grass. So they sat down in groups of hundreds and fifties, taking the five loaves and the two fish, looking up to heaven. He gave thanks and broke the loaves. This will anticipate something later in his ministry. Then he gave them, them to his disciples to set before the people. He also divided the two fish among them all. They all ate and were satisfied, and the disciples picked up 12 baskets fulls of broken pieces of bread and fish. The number of men who had eaten was 5,000. 
Now, they've already been commissioned to go out and do what Jesus did in terms of casting out demons and healing the sick. Now, Jesus says, you feed them, and they have no idea what to do. And Jesus models for them exactly what must be done. He takes the provisions on hand and through blessing them, multiplies them. And this is the context of our story today. The story is, immediately Jesus made his disciples get in the boat and go ahead of him to Bethsaida while he dismissed the crowd. After leaving them, he went up on the mountainside to pray. Now notice Jesus is alone. When Jesus came, the boat was in the middle of the lake and he was alone on land and he saw the disciples straining at the oars because the wind was against them. Shortly before dawn, he went out to them walking on the lake. He was about to pass by them, but when they saw him walking on the lake, they thought he was a ghost. They cried out because they all saw him and were terrified. Now, why he is going to be walking past them, I'm not clear. That must be the perception. When they had crossed, excuse me, he immediately spoke to them and said, Take courage, it is I, don't be afraid. Then he climbed into the boat with them and the wind died down. They were completely amazed, for they had not understood about the loaves. Their hearts were, hearts were hardened. And that's where our reading today left off. Actually, one more verse. When they had crossed over, they landed at Gennesaret and anchored there. As soon as they got out of the boat, people recognized Jesus. They ran throughout that whole region and carried the sick on mats to wherever they heard he was. And wherever he went, to villages, towns, or countryside, they placed the sick in the market marketplaces. They begged him to let him touch even the edge of his cloak, and all who touched him were healed. Now, what is it that we're to see in this story? We're to marvel, perhaps, that our God, made flesh, is capable of taking five loaves and two small fish and feeding 5,000 men plus women and children. That's one possibility. We are perhaps to see something messianic here. For Jesus sees the crowd and has compassion on them, for they are like sheep without a shepherd. There's lots of references to this in the Old Testament. He has compassion on them as one who has a sheep without a shepherd. And what does the good shepherd do? He leads me to green pastures. He feedeth me beside still waters. He restores my soul. That's what the good shepherd does. And Jesus, beside still waters, feeds the sheep, literally. Five loaves, two fishes. Jesus is performing a messianic act. This isn't what a prophet does, unless he's a great prophet, perhaps, like Elijah and that's the other thing going on. The memory of Elijah is being evoked. The memory of Moses is being evoked. Moses, out in the middle of nowhere, God uses Moses to feed a mass of people with bread that rains from heaven. Elijah is in the wilderness, and bread is carried to him by a raven. His provision is made sure. Or was that Elijah? Elisha? I think it's Elijah. I think I have it right. So here we have it. God is speaking out the prophetic through Mark as he shares with us the story of Jesus and the 5,000. And now as he walks on water, I want you to notice something. Second story, right? Mark 4 was the first one. Despite what happened in Mark 4 with Jesus being in the back of the boat and calming the waters and the seas and them saying, what kind of person is this that does this? They are now amazed, that is to say shocked, to see him walking through the wind on the water and coming toward their boat. And then when he says something, they miss it completely. What does Jesus say to them? Don't be afraid, which is a, a greeting that all the angels give to humankind, right? When they, they meet, when, whenever you meet an angel, what's the first word out of the angel's mouth? Don't be afraid, fear not. All right? The first thing Jesus says to them is fear not. That's what an angel would say. And then he says something that no angel would ever say. He says, it is I. Now, what is another way of seeing that phrase? 
I am. It is I. The I am is here. Your very ground of being. There's something more to me than what you can comprehend. It is I. And they miss it completely. He climbs into the boat, quiets the wind. They're able to get to shore. And what does the text say is their spirit about all of this? They were completely amazed, that is to say totally shocked, having been with Jesus, having seen all that he's done, having seen him already calm the water, they are completely amazed. And it says in verse 52, for they had not understood about the loaves and their hearts were hardened. I think the loaves refers to the shepherd who feeds his sheep, what we just read in 634. But if we go backward a little bit to 4.10, we see this other reference, Mark 4.10. When he was alone, the twelve and the others around him asked about the parables. This was something Jesus had been sharing with them, the parable of the sower. The secret of the kingdom has been given to you, but those on the outside, but to those on the outside, everything is said in parables so that they may be ever seeing but never perceiving, and ever hearing, but never understanding. Otherwise, they might turn and be forgiven. And then Jesus said to them, don't you understand the parable? Mark is giving us a very brief, stunted reiteration of this idea. We're talking about the storm, it seems to us in this story, and Jesus is referencing the loaves, that which came before it. I mean, excuse me, Mark is referencing the loaves. The disciples had not understood about the loaves, and then it says their hearts were hardened. We've heard this phrase before whenever it applied to an enemy of God. Pharaoh's heart was hardened. Whether he hardened his own heart or God hardened it, it was hardened against the Israelites going free. Whenever Jesus refers to an enemy, he refers to the hardness of their hearts, someone who's against him. And Mark uses this phrase of the disciples. Their hearts are hardened because they had not understood. So many clues Mark gives us, and yet the disciples have missed it. You see, if you go to Mark chapter 1, very early on we see what this book is about. Mark chapter 1, flip over if you will. Mark chapter 1, verse 1, the beginning of the good news about Jesus, who? The Messiah. Mm. we get our direction. We're beginning to see. He's walked on water, and their hearts are hard because they don't understand about the loaves and the fish. What is it that Jesus will say to Peter as he reinstates him in John 21? Peter, if you love me, feed my sheep. Peter, if you love me, feed my lambs. Peter, if you love me, feed my sheep. This is the mission of Jesus, to feed. And what does Jesus say to the tempter? He says, man shall not live by what? Bread alone or fish alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. So when we're talking about feeding sheep, we're not just talking about a literal feeding, five loaves, two fish, broken up in this miraculous way to feed a multitude. We're talking about all that Jesus had been teaching that day and the inability of those even who were participating in the miracle itself. The disciples were participants in the miracle. They were there spreading the food around and gathering it up. They saw exactly the miracle that was taking place that day. They were participating prior to that. Jesus had sent them out two by two, and they were healing the sick in his name and driving out demons in his name, and they had reported all that they had done. They were not observers. They were participants, disciples. They were learning what we're to do. And their hearts were hardened because they didn't get it. Jesus had come to find the lost, to feed the sheep, physically and spiritually, to redeem those he called his own. 
The miracle of Jesus walking on the water is interesting in its own right. But I want you to hear how dangerous it is for all of us who observe even the extraordinary. For sometimes we miss it. And when we miss it, we're in danger of misunderstanding exactly who it is that says to us, don't be afraid. It is I. The second gospel reading comes from Mark 7, verses 5 through 8, followed by 14 through 15 on Pew Bible, page 929. So the Pharisees and the teachers of the law asked Jesus, why don't your disciples live according to the tradition of the elders instead of eating their food with defiled hands? He replied, Isaiah was right when he prophesied about you hypocrites, as it is written. These people honor me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. They worship me in vain. Their teachings are merely human rules. You have let go of the commandments of God and are holding on to human traditions. Again, Jesus called the crowd to him and said, Listen to me, everyone, and understand this. Nothing outside a person can defile them by going into them. Rather, it is what comes out of a person that defiles them. So if that's true, what Jesus is saying, what comes out of our mouths defiles us, not what goes into them. What comes out of your mouth? In our psalm today, call to worship that Brennan read, it says in verse 2, Psalm 8, 2, through the praise of children and infants, you have established a stronghold against your enemies to silence the foe and the avenger. That is to say, through the words even uttered by the powerless, children and infants, the word uttered by them of praise, has power to silence the foe. So what comes out of your mouth? Words of praise? Words of criticism? Words that lift up or words that tear down? Words of hope? Words of denial? Are your words honest? You know, frankly... We've spent historically a lot of time talking about words that we should and shouldn't use. I tend to theologically think based on what Elijah used to say and words of John the Baptist and things like that, that a sharp word is occasionally a good thing and that we have lots of different words in our language to connote different things that have value and meaning in their place. So rather than focusing on good words and bad words, I would just ask, what is the purpose of the words you speak? Do they make you clean or unclean? Is your testimony, like that of babes, able to silence avengers and enemies? Jesus, in this passage on that which defiles, cuts to the chase. I can't imagine how angry I would be if I were one of the religious leaders listening to this. Isaiah was right when he prophesied about you who act, who play at what you do. Your hearts are far from me. You honor me in vain and worship me in vain, and what you teach is just your own. No power. Remember, when Jesus taught, he taught as one who had what? Authority, not like the teachers, not the scribes and the Pharisees. You see, he had authority because he always got to the heart of the matter in what it is that he spoke. He always was able to bring the gospel in in a very concise way. How did Jesus summarize even the commandments? Do you remember? Love God supremely and your neighbor as yourself. This is the whole law and the prophets. How complicated is that? In theory, very simple. 
in practice a bit more challenging, isn't it? What I want you to hear today in this this little bit that I'm telling is that Christianity is hard. It's hard. We like the easy path, all of us, at least I do. I am a least resistance path kind of guy if I'm not careful and deliberate about it. Maybe you are too. Most of us are, I dare say. Kind of just kind of go along. Christianity calls us to something different and something more. Christianity calls us to the following of one who broke with convention, who didn't do it like everybody else, and who always spoke to the core of the matter. What does it mean to live in an unselfish, self-sacrificing, loving way? What does it mean to take care of those who can't care for themselves? What does it mean to give good news to the brokenhearted? the afflicted? What does it mean to visit the imprisoned, to set them free, the captives? What what do these things mean? These are messianic phrases that Jesus uses, and he calls us to do that work just as he called the disciples to do that work. He notes, you've let go of God's commands and are holding on to tradition, but let me tell you this, Nothing outside a person can defile them by going into them. Rather, it's what comes out of us that makes the difference. Now, I want you to hear what follows in Mark because it's interesting. When this whole topic is over, when Jesus has said what he has to say about it, and there's quite a bit of red writing there in 6, Uh, 7, 6 through 23. Jesus leaves and goes to the vicinity of Tyre, and he entered a house and did did not want anyone to know it, yet he couldn't keep his presence even there a secret. As soon as she heard about him, a woman whose little daughter was possessed by an evil spirit came and fell at his feet. The woman was a Greek born in Syrian Phoenicia. She begged Jesus to drive the demon out of her daughter. Now, why the detail? She was not a Jew. And Jesus says something that to me is shocking. He says, first, let the children eat all that they want, for it is not right to take the children's bread and toss it to the dogs. It seems very harsh, doesn't it? But we read that his mission was first to the Jews, then to the Gentiles. And she replies, even the dogs under the table eat the children's crumbs. Why is it being told so harshly? Why is it being set up this way? Why is Mark writing it this way? He's writing it this way because the faith of a Greek woman, a non-Jew, in a foreign city is sufficient that her daughter is healed. The demon is driven out of her. And it's contrasted with those who have just done all of these miracles with Jesus and just been with him through all of these great events whose hearts are now hardened because they don't understand about the loaves. Interesting juxtaposition, isn't it? And it's even more interesting when we consider what's been said to the Pharisees. She isn't unclean. What comes in or out of her makes her clean or unclean. And she is not unclean because what has come out of her is what? A word of faith. She is a daughter of Abraham after all. She is a child of God after all. Her heritage didn't prevent Jesus from healing her daughter. Her faith gave her access to the kingdom, same as it had with Abraham, same as it does with all of us. Mark isn't, after all, writing us a racist story about a Christ who differentiated and cared about where people came from. Mark isn't trying to shock us with Jesus' directness about the primacy of his mission to the Jews. Mark is helping us to see that nothing is unclean except as it makes itself unclean by virtue of what it says and what it does, how it thinks and what it acts like. You may go 
for such a reply, your demon has left, the demon has left your daughter. And she went and found her child lying on the bed and the demon gone. And then Jesus goes on in the same region. Uh, he leaves actually and goes down to the Sea of Galilee to the Decapolis. And he's brought somebody who is deaf and who can hardly speak. And after Jesus took him aside away from the crowd, notice the pattern in Mark. He banishes the crowd many times when he's about to do something. Jesus put his fingers to the man's ear and then spit and touched the man's tongue. And he looked up to heaven with a deep sigh and said to him, Ephatha, which means be opened. And the man's ears were opened and his tongue was loosened and he began to speak plainly. Jesus commanded them not to tell anyone, but the more he did so, the more they kept talking about it. People were overwhelmed with amazement. There's that word again. He's done everything well. He even makes the deaf hear and the mute speak. Yes, he's Elijah and then some. He's our Messiah. And not just our Messiah, but whereas the disciples themselves don't seem to be able to hear and whereas the Pharisees are criticizing Jesus, Jesus heals now someone who's deaf and mute and makes him speak, noting that it is what comes out of this man's mouth that will defile him. And is he defiled? He is not. He's commanded to keep silent but the more Jesus commands people to be silent, the more the message spreads. A, deaf, a, a man who has been deaf and dumb cannot help but speak. What kind of cruel torture would it be to heal somebody of an affliction and then say you cannot speak? How many of you would obey that command? You would try, right? Because you really appreciated being healed and because you really loved and respected the man who healed you. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. But how do I explain? What is he doing to me? How do I explain to people that I can now hear them? How do I explain that whereas I couldn't speak or mumbled or could speak kind of badly, now I can speak clearly? How do I explain? Can't help but speak. Again, Mark wants us to see a picture of a people healed, a people freed, a people who can't help but speak. Because out of the mouths, what does the psalm say? Through the praise of children and infants, you've established a stronghold against your enemies. Third gospel reading can be found in Mark 8, verses 11 and 12, and that's on page 930 in the Pew Bibles. The Pharisees came and began to question Jesus. To test him, they asked him for a sign from heaven. He sighed deeply and said, why does this generation ask for a sign? Truly, I tell you, no sign will be given to it. I don't think I need to preach this one very long. This request for a sign comes at the conclusion of something really incredible. In Mark 8, Jesus feeds the 4,000. During those days, another large crowd gathered. Since they had nothing to eat, Jesus called to his disciples and said, I have compassion for these people. They've been with me three days and have had nothing to eat. If I send them home hungry, they will collapse on the way because some of them have come a long distance. The disciples answered, but where in this remote place can anyone get enough bread to feed them? Don't you just want to go, ah, do it with me. Feels good. Ah. Jesus has to repeat. All right, so how many loaves do you have? Seven, they replied. Now, there are a couple of ways of looking at this story. You can say, yes, there were seven literal loaves. I'm fine with that. That's what the gospel says. But what is seven? 
the perfect number. It's the number of completion. It's the number of creation. It's the number, yes, it's the number of Sabbath. It is the number of rest. It's Seven is an important number. You have seven loaves, the perfect number, and they don't quite get that. Jesus tells the disciples to sit on the ground, excuse me, the crowd to sit on the ground, and when he had taken the seven loaves and give th- given thanks, there it is, that moment in the upper room again, he broke them and gave them to disciples and set them before the people, and they did so. They had one massive communion that day. They had a few small fish as well, and he gave thanks for them also and told the disciples to distribute them. And the people ate and were satisfied. Afterward, the disciples picked up this time seven basketfuls of broken pieces that were left over. About 4,000 were present. And having sent them all away, he got into the boat with his disciples and went on to the region of Dalmanutha. Remind you of another story? One we just read? It should. Jesus has just fed 5,000. Let's go back to 6. Jesus has just walked on water and calmed the sea. Jesus has just healed a Syrophoenician woman's daughter of a demon possession. Jesus has healed a deaf and a mute man. Jesus has just fed 4,000, and the disciples, excuse me, the Pharisees say, give us a sign from heaven. And Jesus says, why does this generation ask for a sign? I'm not going to give you one. And Jesus left them and got back into the boat and crossed over to the other side. Why does this wicked generation ask for a sign? Jesus has given us evidence enough. The problem with signs is that one is never enough. Think about Gideon. God came to him and said, I want you to do something for me. And he said, well, let me make sure that this is you and that you're going to do what you say you're going to do. Tell you what, the ground is usually wet with dew. I'm going to put a fleece out, and if the fleece is dry while the ground is wet, I think we have a deal. And God humored him. God is so gracious and patient, kind. Gideon went out of his tent or his home, and the fleece was dry and the ground was wet. And he got to thinking about it, and he thought, well, what if it isn't just very absorbent? What if it doesn't pull moisture? What if I've got this scientifically wrong? What if it should be the other way around? So God says, you ready to go, Gideon? He says, no, I need another favor. I'm paraphrasing. Tell you what, God, make this fleece soaking wet and let's have the ground be dry and then we'll talk. So Gideon goes to bed. God is patient, good, and kind. The next morning, Gideon gets up. He goes out of his tent. And he gets one of those wet sock things because he steps in the fleece and it soaks his foot and everything around him is dry. You can just kind of see him shaking that off. And then he says to himself, I know what this is about. Two signs and he's ready to talk to God. And then God tells him to do this incredible thing. You know the story. He narrows it down to 300 people, and Gideon is just thinking this is not going to work. All the way through, he's wondering, is this going to work? And then God defeats Israel's enemy through 300 people that Gideon has pulled together. The problem with a sign is that we always want another. The problem with the sign is that when we've seen one miracle, we doubt and we want to look for another. The problem is when we've seen two, we want three. And before you know it, God isn't God to us. He's a circus show, a freak show, just doing our bidding rather than us submitting and doing his. The problem with signs is that we need another. And in this section, Jesus flatly says, I'm done with signs. You either see it or you don't. 
And what Mark is hoping is that by now, at this point in the gospel, you can see, I can see, all of us can see, Jesus is no teacher. Jesus is no ordinary prophet. Jesus is none other than the Messiah, spoken of and promised in chapter 1, verse 1. He's the one.